And I think I've sh I've shared the screen. Yes, I have. So let's go. Um, let's talk about abstraction. If I'm just going to give you the simplest, so my microphone's on. Yeah, we are recording. If I'm going to give you the simplest definition I could of abstraction, what we're doing with abstraction is we're removing unnecessary information from uh, from a bunch of information that we have, so that we have something simple and accessible that we can use as a model to represent something. Now, the models that we're talking about in, in computing, they're gonna be a model from which we're gonna build a computer system. Uh, so that would be, um, we'll, we'll talk about that in the next lesson when we do an algorithm. An algorithm is gonna be a model that we'll use for our um, computer system. So in order, but we typically, we have a lot of details uh, that represent our problem. And some of those details are necessary uh, for our solution to the problem, and some of them are not. And so what we want to do is we want to remove uh, from our, um, from our um, model, I guess you could say, we build a model out of this, we want to remove from it the things that are not necessary for, the for creating the solution. And we do that, um, the way it's uh, described in the notes here that we have is by layering, we do, we do um, abstraction by layering. Um, and so, Models. Well, here's here's a model. I'll tell you. In this classroom, we used to have um, the periodic table of elements, which is a chemistry thing. Some of you might have studied chemistry at high school or something. You might remember the periodic table. Doesn't that look like that? Uh, except it's nothing to do with chemistry, right? If we look at it, what it is is um, it's tr it's a model. It's a model which shows a relationship between uh, different aspects uh, or components uh, that are part of algorithms or part of abstraction. So our two lessons this week, we're gonna talk about algorithms and, and abstraction. Today is abstraction. When we do abstraction, we want to know things like properties. So I mentioned we have details, right? Details would be the, the, some of those properties, but we want only the very, very essential ones, right? We don't want every single uh, property. We want uh, the types of data that are stored. So uh, with types of data, that would be things like, um, you know, is it a or a string or a character? Those are those are types, uh, data types we call them. Uh, now, a list uh, a list is is uh, is, a, is a complex data type. Uh, what happens with a list is you have um, a bunch of data which is of the same type usually, not always. Uh, in Python, it doesn't have to be, uh, but it would usually be of the same type and it's sort of linked together. And uh, you can add things to it and subtract things from it, usually from one end or the other. Uh, list is very useful. Another name for list we sometimes refer to an array, which is very at least very similar to a list. We'll be doing that in our course. Um, now the last point there is about a dictionary. A dictionary is a way uh, it's storage point for a bunch of uh, different data types, a bunch of different data uh, in um, in Python. In your second, third courses in Python, you'll have to create dictionaries. And dictionaries are very useful in Python for solving problems quickly. Um, so it's a uh, very complex uh, relative to our simple data types. All right, so that's abstraction. Tomorrow, I think our lesson is tomorrow, we'll be looking at algorithms. And uh, I think these things might seem familiar to you a little bit, uh, at least these bits a uh, sequence, decision, and iteration. We find those in all of our algorithms. Well, not all of our algorithms, but most algorithms are going to have all of these elements. So all of our algorithms, all, all of our algorithms will have some of them. And action, uh, they can be represented by words, or they can be represented by some drawing. Uh, so you saw a flowchart. Do you remember that? Um, so in the flowchart, uh, we we could represent sequence by arrows going from one from one uh, command to another. Uh, one process to another decision we did with um, uh, a diamond shape, you know, and uh, the inside the diamond shape was a condition. And if it was true, we went one direction. And if it was false, we went another direction. Uh, iteration is just things that are repeated. Um, and so all of those are used in computing. Uh, on the bottom, sort of, uh, it looks like it's holding all of those things up, is this idea of state. Uh, the idea is that you can have things that change as the computer program progresses, or as the computer system 
uh, pro processes. Uh, and typically, we're going to use uh, variables to uh, have a, a um, an idea of our state. So numbers will change, uh, Boolean variables will change, on, off, true, false, that kind of thing. So uh, as our program processes progresses, things can change. And so we say the state changes. Um, right, so what about abstraction? I hope that I gave you this idea a minute ago when I tried to give my sort of uh, definition of abstraction for our point of view. Now, by the way, if you go and if you go to a dictionary and look for abstraction, uh, it'll give you a couple of different definitions, right? If you want to, uh, that kind of definition, like you'd find by doing a Google search, make sure you say abstraction for computer programs or abstractions in, in computing or in programming, because there's other abstractions like abstract painting, you know, uh, and that's where they do things that don't look like reality too much. They got, you know, and abstract art. It's not the same as abstract in computing, right? So our abstract in, well, well it, I mean, maybe it is. I mean, we're, we remove a lot of detail. Uh, I, it, in a, I, I don't know, I'm not qualified to talk about abstract art, <laughs> but uh, you, know, you might be interested in that. Um, <clears throat> So uh, we only want the relevant, relevant information. We call that abstraction. We remove anything that is not relevant. When we've got uh, only those very relevant details, we can take those and use them to make a model, um, which we could call a algorithm. Uh, now let's look at this one. Um, now I should actually put this up so I can see if there's any notes, no? So uh, the Rotherham, Rotherham is a real town. But it doesn't have a real underground. So the um, the this is a mythical sort of uh, idea. Or, uh, if Rotherham had an underground, it might be like this. <laughs> so what we have on the left is a map of Rotherham, and the map has a lot of detail to it. So there's, for example, there's uh, detail to the level of having different shades of the land and water, I guess, uh, which represent different uses. Um, so you could have some industrial area, some residential area, we've got some roads and maybe some rivers, and all of those things are represented in there. If you were going to go walking around Rotherham, Rotherham, and if you wanted to sort of buy a house there or something like that, uh, this map would be very useful to you. Right? Now, the big dark lines on it are supposed to represent this uh, mythical um, sort of underground or underground equates to metro, equates to two. You know what I mean, right? It's a, a train system that uh, is in, in a city area. Now, if we took this one and we removed a lot of the unnecessary detail, so we don't need to, uh, if we're riding on the underground, if we're a passenger and we want, to, we want to get from one part of the city to the other, we might not need to know all the different land uses. We might not need to know where all the roads are and everything. Or rivers, but we would need to know where all the stations are and you know how those stations are joined by the underground and so how you could get from one station to another and if you removed all the stuff that you didn't need you might end up with a map kind of like this so this is an abstraction isn't it our model here is abstract does that make sense we've we've uh, removed many layers of, of detail that's the kind of thing that we want to do here's another example just like that and no no notes. <clears throat> Washington, D.C. has a metro station too, metro system. And um, kind of like the Doha metro, uh, the, uh, it has multiple lines which are then color coded. And uh, that's very useful for people getting on the line. You know, if you get on the red line and you stay on it and don't get off, you'll end up over here, right? Because it'll just keep going, right? Uh, on the other hand, you know, if you get on at the red line over here, and you want to get over here, then somewhere around, well, not somewhere around, you're going to have to stop at this station here and change trains, right? change, change, um, and, and then you'll be able to get to there. Um, so very easy to read. Uh, it, it's useful. We do have a few sort of features that are mentioned there. I mean, got some water. So um, that's probably because uh, maybe train station riders, us train riders, they wouldn't want to get off at a station over here if it was something on the other side of that river, right? Because, you know, they might not be able to get over. Uh, yeah, so maybe some, a, a little bit 
but there certainly isn't the detail uh, on there that we had in the Rutherham map here, right? We got rid of a lot of this detail. If you looked at a map of Washington, there's, there's a lot of detail in it, but here we got very, very uh, simple detail. So that's an abstraction. Here's another map. <clears throat> this is a map of uh, the state of Virginia um, in the United States. So uh, the, what I noticed on this map is it has uh, various sizes of uh, width um, used for the uh, various roads. We know that these would be roads. And so that, that's an abstraction, right? It's not like a picture of a road or anything. We know that uh, the uh, heavier ones are probably going to be the more main roads, the arterial roads. And actually they're nicely labeled as well. So it's kind of hard for you to see that, but that actually says 95, that's the high 95. Can you see that? I don't know. Uh, you'll be able to see it on your thing. So there's the I-95 and there's the I-85. Um, in the United States, the um, highways, if they're an interstate highway, interstate, that means it goes between states, right? Um, uh, the, the numbers go, if it has a five at the end of it, that means that it's a north-south. And so on the, on the West Coast in California, you got the I-5, and that goes from San Diego up to... Uh, up to Seattle. Then you got the I-15 that goes from Los Angeles up to Salt Lake and up into uh, Montana. And, and uh, so here on the wet, on the East Coast, you got the I-95, which goes from Maine down to uh, Florida. And then in the middle, you got the I-35 that goes down to Texas. Uh, you, I don't know, you might not care about that, but it would be really useful if you're like a truck driver. Oh, right, you see that I-95, I know what that does. That goes no south. If I wanted to go to Maine, I'm getting on that. Right. Um, likewise, if you have, now the other numbers, uh, if you've got a 64, that's going to go east west, right? If it's got an even number. Uh, if it was an interstate, it would have a zero on the end of it. Like uh, they have the I, I 90, the I 80, the I 40, the I 10. I don't know, you probably wouldn't care about that. But um, if you were a truck driver or something like that, this map would be very useful to you. There's a lot of stuff that that uh, is not shown in the map, but we have got the detail that you'd need. Okay, so these are the main roads, I'll probably go on those. Don't wanna go on those little roads because maybe they got short, sharp turns on them and stuff like that. If I got a big truck, it might be hard to get it around there. Another one we, where we've got some abstraction going on, right? So this map is the same state of Virginia. Um, and this is the map that you'd look at in the morning, I suppose, uh, when you, when you looked at, uh, well, what am I going to wear today? You know, <laughs> do I need to take a raincoat with me? And you might look at that and say, oh, well, there's some clouds there that kind of look kind of rainy, but not really, it's not showing any rain and the temperatures are quite warm. So just by looking at that map, depending on your, where you were in Virginia, you could say, oh yeah, whether or not you needed a raincoat. Not like Doha, where people wouldn't wear a raincoat because they like to get wet because it doesn't rain very much, right? <laughs> Go out and play in the rain, right? Those places, it actually rains a lot. Um, both, both maps that we saw are the same place, but they show different information because they're for different users, right? So when we're doing our abstraction, we keep in mind who's going to look at, the, who's going to need this model? And, uh, you know, what is the information? Here, the information that's needed was weather information. In the previous one, the information needed was, how do I drive around here? Information. <coughs> you might say, well, nobody uses those anyways because everybody uses Google Maps. Ah, I think some people still use um, the other maps just to get the, the overall view, right? Um, so we've got physical abstractions of physical things, that's a map that we saw like the map of uh, Virginia, we have a map of, uh, of Qatar and information abstractions of physical things can also be formed. And it's informational abstractions include things like properties, et cetera. So let's suppose that we wanted to have a um, information system for the college. Uh, there's a lot of information that we'd want to stop, solve, uh, store. We'd want to store information about our students. We'd want to store information about our teachers. We want to store information about the rooms and we want to store information about the programs. We don't want to store every bit of information. You know, we could go to the students and ask them, you know, do you have any brothers and sisters? You know, how old your brother? Um, you know, where, where do your sisters and brothers live? 
we could store that, but it's not important to us. Does that make sense? Uh, we don't need that in order to put students in a class. Where there's very little personal information we need for students. We need to know their cutter ID, uh, probably their age, so just so that we can identify them. Just a little bit to identify them. Uh, that we'd, we'd be more interested in, you know, what were their grades in high school? You know, like that, uh, so that we can see, um, have an idea of what classes they need to take. Uh, maybe there's a foundation course they need to take. We, we'd be interested in their IELTS results and, and, and their math results. Yeah, uh, so there's some information we need to get. And likewise for the teachers, you know, the qualifications, um, those types of things you, you would need to have. And then, then all of those things would go into to be stored somewhere. Um, for each person, there's some properties. So each person, you can think of each person as an entity. And then there's some properties that will be uh, related to that entity. So things like a name of a person is, an, is a property of the entity person. And so students and teachers are, are people that are stored in our systems. And they would have um, name, uh, cutter ID number, those types of things. Uh, when we store information on entities, uh, we need to store different kinds of information. <clears throat> Everything okay, Susan? I, uh, I have to get my gun and make sure that I can. When we store information, we um, the computer needs to store information in zeros and ones, right? And we we look at information in different ways. But if we're going to do calculations, we're going to have to store it some way as a number. And we've got a couple of different ways of doing numbers, or we've got three or four actually, but, uh, and, but they're based on this. The, um, the base is either gonna be integer or float, uh, integer being a whole number and float being a number with decimal uh, fraction, fraction dec decimals. Um, strings, it's a bunch of characters together. You can have individual characters and there's other, there's other um, types of data. When we um, consider information that we're going to store about people, for example, a name wouldn't be stored as an integer. It would be stored as a string. All right. Um, a, uh, yeah. I mean, if you, were, if you were storing information about somebody's salary, you would store that as a float, not as a string, right? Because you need to do some calculations on it, that type of thing. Uh, if you're storing stuff on students' grades, their GPA, you would store that as a float, not as a string, because you need to do calculations on it. So depending, do we need to do calculations? What are we using that data for? Then we're going to store it in a different way. So we, we are going to look at in this lecture a little bit. Um, a lot of the examples come from relational databases. Relational databases, the, the data is all going to be stored in a table. And, and that's really nice because um, it's so natural for us. We'd say it's intuitive or whatever, but people can look at a table and they can understand it. People who are not computing people, just basic anybody can look at a table and it's sort of self, just by looking at it, you kind of know. So, I mean, you can look at this table without any instructions in computing and you'd see that, all oh, right, this is a table about movies and you know, each movie has a title, has a year, length, etc. And look, look, here's one tape, one movie, here's another movie. But if you studied computing, it would mean a little bit more to you, right? You'd realize, well, what this table really is, this table is about entities called movies, and those entities have various properties. Some of the properties that they have is they have a title, they have a year, they have a length, uh, they have a genre, etc. And each of those is going to be stored in a different format, right? So the uh, the name of the or the title of the, of the movie is going to be stored as a string. Um, year is an integer, yeah, okay, so we can calculate with it. Length also is as an integer. Well, that assumes that we don't have any sex. Yeah, that's fine. Um, genre, string, string, mostly string. Price as a float, fine. Float is to give us our decimals. You can multiply the price by 100. Oh, no, never mind. <laughs> so you can work with the um, integers. So we use this idea of layering. This slide here talks about layering. I want to just make sure we don't have any notes. We don't have any notes. Um, the idea is every time you apply another layer uh, on your mass of data or information that you want to turn into an abstract model, 
every time you apply another layer, uh, more of that information is obscured or not seen so that you have a, a simpler model that you, you do. So we add more layers to get it simpler and simpler and simpler until we get to the level of simplicity, I guess, which works for us in that particular circumstance. Now, so, and as it says, we can make it simpler by adding a layer, or we can, maybe we, we need to get some of that detail back because we made it too simple. So maybe we need to peel back a layer. Um, yeah, so, but every time, if you want to make it so that we're removing details, we, we call that adding a layer of abstraction. Um, so maybe this diagram sort of shows that a little bit. So what we've got is we've got a diagram which shows the same thing looking at it in two different ways. And I would say that the way on the left is more abstract, all right? So what both of these things represent is somebody sending an email, all right? So on the right, we have kind of a little bit more realistic, you know? Um, so if you were gonna send an email, you would turn on your computer and you'd go to your email interface. That's what this is trying to show, right? When I go to run my email, I go to this interface. Now your interface probably doesn't look like that, but I know you, you've probably seen an interface like that somewhere, right? Um, and anyways, and then when I uh, have finished typing up the email, uh, it's gonna be stored on my computer briefly at least. Um, and it will be stored how? All storage is in zeros and ones. It's gonna be stored as a bunch of zeros and ones. <coughs> Not as simple as this. It's not going to be three lots of zeros and ones. It's going to be, you know, a lot. So, I mean, I think you could say that for your standard uh, A4 page of just typing, that's about a, a kilobyte or a thousand bytes, where a byte is eight bits, where a bit is a zero or a one. Right? So, uh, so you got a one page email that should be somewhere around a thousand um, of these things. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's a little bit more than this, right? Um, that's without any pictures or anything. <laughs> so it would be stored like that with the stored in computer memory. But in computer memory, that's all it is, right? Zeros and ones. I mean, if you go and look at what's in computer memory, we typically look at it uh, in its hexadecimal form um, because it's just easier to read it in hexadecimal form. That, you know how to do that now, right? You know what hexadecimal was. And so if you saw like a 2F, you'd know what that was, right? Um, so uh, yeah, so uh, we do that, but but really with the hexadecimal form, it's just it's just a simpler way of representing our binary. Then the email is going to be uh, sent, and when it's sent from our memory, it's going to go over a network. Uh, network might be a Wi-Fi network, or it might be a wire. Uh, so if it's a wire, uh, you would have some kind of change in voltage that would pass across the network very quickly, where the change of voltage would be oscillating between zero volts and five volts. Uh, and so zero volts would represent a zero and five volts would represent a one. And so that's how you get your binary going across there. And so on the left, so on the right, that's, that's you yeah. know, but isn't this sort of easier? Somebody who wasn't a computer person could look at this and say, all right, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna launch the email application, then I'm gonna write my email, store it on the memory, then I'm gonna send it. Or we could say, here's what the email application looks like, then this is what the storage data looks like, and then this is what it looks like on the network. Now, does anybody care? I don't know, maybe people in IT care, but you know, uh, the, the um, on the left, I think uh, I like to use the word, it's accessible, right? Uh, your standard person can just look at it and understand what's going on without having to have a three hour lecture on it, right? And so as opposed to something where, I mean, I had to, you, at some point in your recent history, you wouldn't have known what this was, right? And uh, at some point in your recent history, you wouldn't know what the representation of that was, but you all know what we mean by this, right? You know what I'm saying? So our, uh, our uh, abstraction is, is very helpful. So as I said, we're in this uh, lecture on, a, on, a, on abstraction, we, we talk a lot about data that's gonna be stored in a database. And uh, so 
and also about object-oriented programming. So that's what it says here, right? Object-oriented programming. In object-oriented programming, we have objects, and objects have um, have uh, properties about them. So you have classes with properties, and so you can store an object like a car, and then cars can do things, and cars have certain properties. So a car can be red, blue, or whatever, and the car can't drive or, or stop. Uh, so you can do that type of thing just using a programming language like Python. Uh, so what if you created a um, object and you called your object vehicle, and then the vehicle could have lots of lots of properties about it. You know, uh, I, in addition to these things, you'd have properties about what is its make, um, what is its um, how, when did you purchase it, all those things. So that's why we've got the dot dot dot. There's a lot of information on there. Um, so this um, particular mythical system would be one that's being used by a rental company. Uh, so they're renting out their cars and customers would want to have a particular car. The cars would be in different classes, uh, you know, based on you know, their, their size, et cetera. Um, and and uh, their, their level of luxury, I guess, um, that they would be different uh, prices that would go in classes. Um, but the rental company might also rent out sort of semi-commercial or commercial vehicles, uh, particularly the people that want to move things around. Maybe they want to move their house, you know, and so they could go and they could rent like a, almost like a truck from the, from this company. And so we call that a van, right? So a van, if they're renting van, there'd be some other things they'd want to know that you wouldn't want to know just for your ordinary car. So in particular, you'd want to know how much space is there in the um, back of that van. So, um, so, uh, you know, how many trips are they going to have to make kind of thing with this, with this rental van to do their moving. Work. And so you might want to create a new object uh, just for vans. But when you created that new object for vans, you'd recognize that there's a lot of things about the van that are similar to every other vehicle, right? The van is also going to have next to it, state wheel size, weight, etc. The van is like vehicle. It's just that we have some special things about it that we need to store. So we refer to this relationship between the van and the vehicle as a kind of an inheritance and a, like a parent-child relationship. So what we mean is when we created this object called the van, we said this object called the van inherits all of the properties of the object called the vehicle. All right, so we had a special type of object class, which is vehicle. And our van inherits all of those, but it's got some other special ones. And you can do that in um, object-oriented languages. Uh, this course is not about object-oriented languages, so I'm not going to say a lot more about that. Um, I think what you'll find is in these lectures, I, I'll mention a lot of things like that, that it'll be like, oh, yeah, whatever. Um, but they'll show up two, three semesters from now and where it'll be a, a major feature of your course. Right, so at the moment, we're just sort of introducing some terms that you might say. So um, as you are abstracting, yeah, adding layers of um, suppression, when we say suppression, it means we're hiding things. So as you are hiding more and more of the details, eventually you get to the point where you need to stop hiding the details, because if you hide any more, you won't have um, enough usable to make a model. And so that's what the point is here. Um, if you go too far, then it will be misleading. And then you'll probably have to go in the reverse direction. So you might, somebody might argue that when we did the vehicle class, we had abstracted far enough that we didn't store information about the storage capacity because we thought nobody needed storage capacity, right? But it turns out that when they have a van, they do need storage capacity. So we had to go back and readjust our model uh, and sort of undo the abstraction to give us another little model that brought back some of the details that we'd lost. Now, luckily here, most of our vehicles don't need that. And so they can just start, sort of stay as a parent class. And we're just going to have this um, child class. So, my gosh, I've got to get going. Uh, why am I going so slow? Uh, so there we have a caution. So that's what we mean by leaking details. Uh, leaking details of, uh, in the van case, uh, there were some details that we abstracted, but we needed to get them back. And so they leaked back out um, the storage, 
the storage capacity we needed to, to get that. Um, yeah, this one comes up all the time. So maybe you needed to, um, maybe you needed to know some information about brake pads. Brake pads are a very important sort of um, uh, safety issue. Right? So maybe that's, uh, that was when you did all your abstractions, you know, and uh, you had your service information, et cetera, you abstracted out brake pads. Right? Uh, we don't care about brake pads, but you know, we'll just sell these cars off. But then you changed your model and it's like, okay, so we really need to test these brake pads on a sort of a monthly or yearly basis to make sure that they're within the limits. Um, and so that would be a leaky abstraction. So what, what we'd have to do is go and amend our model and put back in the brake pads. Brake is spelled that way. Uh, there's more than one brake, you know, right? So the brake that was there is the one where you have a stick and you bend it until it breaks. This is when you're braking in a car. Okay, modeling. So I think modeling and abstraction, they're kind of pretty tightly related. I'm not gonna say they're the same thing, but pretty tightly related. When you've abstracted enough, you're going to have details at a broad enough level that you're gonna be able to build a model from it. Um, and that's kind of what we're going to do. So, uh, and a model is an abstraction because a model is a simplified version of something in the real world. And so a model could be, uh, so for example, for a computer system. When I was 11 years old, I used to make model airplanes, right? So model airplanes. And so what was the idea there? I mean, they were made out of plastic, right? And so each model airplane might have like 50 parts, you know, compared to a real airplane that has like, I don't know, thousands of parts, right? So it's obviously simplified. But what, what the model airplane did capture is they did a pretty good job of capturing the dimensions of the outside of the airplane in terms of the wings and the fuselage and et cetera. I mean, it looked like the real airplane and then you could paint it. And that was very satisfying. It met its purpose. So the purpose of that model, it just had to represent a, a um, airplane, but very much simpler. Of course, it didn't have working engines or anything like that. You know, the inside of the fuselage was empty. Um, so it was very, very, very simplified, but it did sort of represent a much simplified version of something that's real in the real world. Uh, speaking of that, so here we have a model of a model or a model of modeling. <laughs> Abstraction as modeling. Uh, so when we're doing our abstractions, we might make a model. And uh, this is this model is actually uh, data modeling. We, we make models of data. And so you'll see this later when you, you will uh, do a, a relational database course. You'll have to do some data modeling probably. And uh, you'll use, these are symbols that you'd use in a data modeling um, scenario, right? So you have something which is real. Again, it's gonna, uh, something real is gonna be complex. We're going to um, just take some simplified version of it and represent that in a model. And then that model, so the arrow represents, uh, is re the uh, words that are decided say what that arrow is doing, but that shows a relationship between the two entities. So you have an entity, which is your model, and you have your entity, which is reality. And so their relationship is re represented by the arrow and this described it. So the model hides some of the details. You would do entity relationship modeling. Maybe you will do that. I hope, I don't know. I imagine not in this course, don't worry about it. That's probably the first and last time you're gonna see that. So that's why in data modeling, I just mentioned to you, you do entity relationship modeling. Well, look at this. When you do modeling of data, you have entities and you have relationships. And that gives us entity relationship modeling. And uh, it kind of looks like that, where each of, this, each of the boxes is an entity and the lines are the relationships. And so you can do that with these things here. You could have a box for A and you could have a box for B and you could have an arrow that goes between them. Right, so you'd have an arrow that goes from A to B, which is, and then written beside it, you'd say belongs to. And so likewise for C and D, you'd uh, have a box for C, a box for D, and an arrow that goes contains. And that's very useful to you if you're going to have 
you're going to organize your data storage. How is the data going to be stored? What is the relationship? What is the database? And there's some others there. E happens before F and G occupies the same page, space as H. So again, a little bit more on entity relationship models for each of those entities. So entities here are represented by these boxes. For each of those entities, the entity will have a number of properties. So a model has properties uh, and the reality has properties. Um, so for those properties, oops, slide 19. For those properties, we need to represent those in our abstraction as we're building our model. So as it says there, properties are information about the entity or the relationship. So for example, uh, as I said, if we are doing some data modeling on the college, a student would be an entity. And then there would be properties about the student that would be important to us, you know, name, cutter ID, uh, then some things about their grades and stuff. Um, so that would be um, stored in a table about the student. Uh, the, now the type, as I said, you know, the grade would be uh, a float. So it's a number with a decimal and their name would be a string. And then any rules that relate between entities. So students take courses. That's a relationship, right? It's a rule, right? Uh, well, some of the rules around that would be, well, how many courses can they take? You know, you can't just take any course. So there's a lot of rules in there, right? IT students. Cannot, cannot take, there's probably some course over there in, well, they cannot take the course until they've done the prerequisite. That's a rule, right? And so, that, so you could put that into a business, um, in, into a business model. Uh, behaviors, um, students take exams. That's a behavior, right? And then they get a grade. All right, so we got some notes here. I'm showing those because as I said, I can't give those to you in text form, but you can look at them here and they will be on the video. Uh, so states, things that change over time. And uh, I mentioned states in the context of um, variables, um, but our entities and relationships change, the student state change, right? We have a student which is a um, current student, then we have a student who's graduated, right? Um, uh, we have this, the first year student, we have the second, so that's changing. Um, if they didn't change, it would be static. If all we did is keep a history of, um, you know, the student before they came to the college, that would just be a static database. But our databases are, and our systems are dynamic. So, I mean, you know, we, we're recording your attendance, we're recording every grade that you get. And so it's a very dynamic model in our system. And so your state is changing. Okay. Yeah. So that would mean when we made a model of our system, we'd have to have some way of showing that the person's GPA changes every semester and things like that. And uh, so that has been built in through the modeling. And here's an example of a dynamic. Dynamic means it changes, static means it doesn't change, right? So uh, this is a very simple model. Uh, that is trying to illustrate what happens when you go to the metro and there's a little machine there that stops you from entering. So we call that a turnstile in this case. The turnstile is like you, you put it, it says put in a coin, but I think you actually just use a card and you put it on a card reader and then the clutch on this device releases and you can turn it and then you can get in, right? That sound right? So that represents this. If you don't bring your card, if you, you don't bring your card and you just push, so the black dot represents the starting point. So you start here and you just push without, um, without putting, you know, paying. So paying is represented here by insert coin, but I think that I would also include, you know, just by a card. Um, but it, so supposing you 